like we are live a little bit early today. I couldn't wait to get started. Uh, so welcome everybody. I'm Scott with Artist Network and this is Drawing Together. I just, I love reading all the comments that are coming in, especially seeing that, that Margot and Liz are connecting a, a, a continent apart. So that's really awesome. Um, welcome to all you familiar names out there. If you're new, I'd love to hear from you and see where you're watching from. Um, this is what we're working on today. So this is a drawing of clouds and I worked on this in charcoal. Uh, so that's what I'll be working on today. But if you have, if you have graphite, if you have plain paper, I hope you're going to be able to draw along with me. Um, you know, it'll be a little bit different uh, since I'm going to be working on toned paper. Um, but it, I think you'll be able to hopefully walk away with, with something that's, that's uh, pleasing for you. So, um, Let's take a look at the materials here. I'm going to come back to talking about this drawing in a little bit. Um, in the meantime, uh, again, if you're new, you're going to want to know that you can find the, uh, the reference uh, photo for this in the description below. Uh, so check that out. Um, and as well as the list of materials, I am working on this as an 11 by 14 sheet of the gray tone Strathmore paper. I've been using this quite a bit for my, my tone paper. Um, what I'm working on today with materials, though, is I've been experimenting with uh, this Derwent scent, uh, set of tinted charcoal. Uh, now, if you don't have this set, that's fine. I think just a normal charcoal pencil will work. Um, but these have been a lot of fun to play around with because you can see they come in a variety of these colors. Uh, so they've been tinted uh, in this way. Uh, these are the three that I'm actually going to be working with. So this is a, the neutral, uh, the white, and then the dark. So essentially, it, it's pretty close to black. But what I like about this so far is that it allows me to really control the temperature of the drawing. Uh, so it's not necessarily drawing in color, but you can kind of enhance it, enhance it a little bit that way. So if you haven't tried it, um, I would recommend kind of experimenting with it and see what works. Um, what I found is that there's a, a variation in hardnesses between them. Some of them are a little bit harder than others. Um, and in experimenting on the different types of paper what will, I think, take you a long way. So I found that these three worked really well for this smooth uh, gray drawing paper. Um, some of the others just work better on a charcoal paper. So. Um, that's what I'm going to be working with. If you don't have these, like I said, you can be working in graphite. Uh, you can work with just regular uh, charcoal pencil. I, I, um, this isn't really a, a super high contrast drawing. Uh, so I think if you have like a harder uh, charcoal, I think that's going to serve you well. You don't necessarily have to have a, a really dark, soft one like I, I typically draw with. Um, but like I said, whatever you have, I think will work. Um, I also have, of course, my uh, kneaded eraser. I've got my rubber eraser and my blending stump that I forgot. So I've got my, my trusty blending stump. I'm running out of these. I got to get a new set of them. But um, there, I, I don't. I won't be using this a whole lot. And I'm actually going to be mixing a bit with this. So I'm only going to use one. But you may find it helpful to have one for your darks and one for your lights if you're working with both black and white charcoal. So. Um, before we get started, uh, if you do have any questions, just let me know. Um, I have one that just came in, a 6B pencil. Yes, I think a 6B would work really well for this. Um, I, that's what I prefer. I like the, the darker, um, softer graphite. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, like I said, whatever you've got, I think will, will work just fine. Um, the, like I said, it's not a high contrast image. And so if you don't have something as soft or as dark as a 6B, and if you have just like a, a even a regular yellow uh, you know writing pencil, then I think that would get you what you need for this. I think you'll be able to walk away with something strong. Um, Ania is saying you've been, you've worked with these tinted charcoals. Uh, yeah, they're they've been a lot of fun. Uh, they also have tinted graphite and some other materials that I'm really um, kind of excited to play around with. Um, so getting back to this, what I kind of like about this as a subject is that it it frees me up a little bit in terms of needing to control the, the, uh, the proportions for the drawing. So, you know, so some, some subjects really require kind of a, a higher focus on proportions, but with something like clouds, it's really for me about trying to understand what is happening with the, the form um, and, and how it all works together. So in this uh, example, and with the reference, I got to bring that up on my screen. You can see the variation um, in edges, in forms. You have some of these kind of tighter, crisper, kind of 
softer kind of bubbly forms and then some softer wispier ones. Um, you have large areas of gradation like in this area. Um, you have areas where you have bounce light like right in here where the light's coming in from this direction and it's, it's reflecting strongly off of this edge of this cloud front but kind of catching in this bowl in here, right? And so what I'm thinking about as I go through the drawing is really is, is what's happening with the form and the structure and try to recreate that, um, but kind of freeing myself up from really being too precise with the, the specific proportion. So, you know, if I make this a little bit too large or small, or if I, you know, play around with the scale, if I make this portion back here larger or smaller, as long as I get the basic structure, I think I'm going to be in good um, shape because, you know, clouds in their nature are always changing and they're, they're moving, they're growing, they're shifting, especially clouds like this that are kind of building and, and building into these uh, larger kind of thunderheads. Um, the idea of, of matching it one-to-one -one becomes less critical, if that makes sense. So that's just kind of my overall thinking as I get into it. Now, I'm going to try my best to try to match that, um, you know, initially kind of give my initial reactions, but I'm not going to spend too much time working on that. And then with this lower portion here, it's, I'm just going to really kind of suggest it. For me, you know, the inclusion of the ground plane really becomes an opportunity to create contrast and allow some of these darks to create contrast against the light. So it makes the sky a bit more luminous. Without that, I think you'll see that it's gonna be relatively flat. And once we drop in those darks, it's gonna really um, become stronger. So hopefully that makes sense as an overview. Again, if you have any questions, I'd love to, uh, to hear them. I also love to hear any sort of suggestions as I go. So if you see something that looks off or if you have any questions about why I might be missing something, uh, just let me know. Uh, all right. If you have vine charcoal, it can be helpful to start this stage with the vine charcoal, but I'm going to go right for this, this, uh, yeah, this neutral, or natural, I'm sorry, tinted charcoal. Uh, and I want to start just kind of laying in uh, the, the rough kind of ground plane here. So just using the side of the pencil, I like to use this overhand grip. This is really all about a gesture. Um, and those of you who have been drawing with me for a while know that this stage is all about uh, getting information on the page. It's not about making it accurate, but reacting to it. So I'm moving my eyes quickly back and forth between the subject, which is right here. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's where I have my reference images off to my left here. So um, I have that up and I'm moving my eyes quickly back and forth uh, between the drawing and uh, the reference photo. And if anything, prioritize your time with the reference photo. So spend more time looking at the reference photo, making observations, um, and really kind of glance at the page. Now this uh, natural um, tint of the charcoal is lighter in value than this black that I have. So this is why I say I think it would work well as a, as a vine charcoal layer. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm just going to block in this whole ground plane. And as I'm doing this, I'm rolling the pencil in my fingers so that I'm not creating any flat spots on the core. And you can, as you, as you know, I like to sh shave my pencil down to expose more of that core. Um, it allows me to continue to work with the material a little bit longer and maintain a sharp edge. And part of what I'm looking at now is I'm going, to, I'm going to take another pass at this, but I'm going to now kind of shift and start to look at the negative space to see if I can make any um, kind of initial adjustments. Um, and I can do kind of a quick assessment looking at there's this tree right here that's going to be a bit of a landmark, and I want to make sure that that's placed properly along that bottom ground plane. That's, that's pretty darn close. I don't need it to be 100% accurate at this point. What I need is for this to read as a dark value. Now, one of the things we talked about when working with the toned paper is that there's a tendency for our eyes to calibrate to the values we see here. Um, and so over time, we'll start to read this as light. And then once we add the white on top of it, it's really going to pop that, that value. Um, so it's mostly creating almost like a no tan. I don't know if that's a term that you are all familiar with. A no tan is essentially just a, a black and white version of the composition to help 
um, see the large masses and especially the, the shape of the light and shadow. Um, and I, I'm adding a little bit more, it looks like I'm bringing up that, that ground plane. And I, you know, because on the photograph, it's really dropped down low. I'm adding just a little bit more. And I, that wasn't an intentional thought, but I want to evaluate that before I make that change. I want to see if that's something that is going to serve me all right in the drawing. Because I kind of like it, I like having a little bit more weight on that bottom. Um, so I think I will keep it in it. I may, <laughs> I may regret it later. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so, yeah, there's just, I think there's just a little bit, or it's pretty close. Uh, I'm going to wipe this down. I'm going to smudge it a little bit. This, this, uh, this natural uh, pencil is a little bit softer than some of the other ones, like I said. I, I did notice that some of the other colors were a little bit harder and kind of scratchier. So, um, Oh, Nia, the puffin in the background. I was working on that. I worked with some uh, some Blick uh, markers and created that image. And this is one I want to do. Um, I may actually do this next week, I do a drawing, a black and white drawing of that for next week, the puffin. Uh, so I just need to, to get that worked out. Um, I, knew, I do have some issues with... Um, internet has been a little tricky today, so hopefully it's not too blurry. Um, let me, I'm going to try to adjust something really quickly here. Uh, see if I can increase the, the sharpness. So I, I don't know what is going on with the internet today, but if, if it does, um, if it does fail, stick with us, I'll, I'll, I'll be back. Uh, so I just kind of adjust, made some adjustments on my end that hopefully will sharpen up, but it may bog things down. So. Um, all right, what is, that? So what is that that holds the puff in? So yeah, this is just a drawing board back here. So I have, a, I have the drawing just on uh, the, this, this pen, the marker drawing, just on regular smooth paper. And this is the, uh, I was looking at the, the cat from a few episodes back. So that's what we've got there. Um, and this is actually, this is called an artistic easel. It's, check that out if you, if you get a chance. It's kind of a fun one. It's a different way of, of, of uh, um, holding supports and I've been experimenting with. Um, so yes, so back to that. Yeah, the puffin. I'm excited about that. That was a lot of fun to work on. So I'm excited for next week. Um, so what do we, what we want to do here? I want to, it, it's really helpful to have a small scale version of the reference photo. So that's what's actually right in front of me. I'm looking in front of me at what you are seeing. That, so that's the small image of the reference below me. And so I'm going to use that as my guide right now, because what I want to do is try to see the large masses of value, especially in this bulky cloud. I'm not going to do like a strong outline early on. I want to start to think of it in terms of mass. And what you can kind of see is if you were to cover up this half, this is largely in dark, this side is largely light. And so that helps me to kind of create a, a rough orientation for myself. And I want to just kind of rough in some of that form. And I like, again, I like to use the side of my pencil for this because it discourages the use of line because I can get a little heavy with line um, early on. And if you, I, I, I've worked with, with students in the past who struggled with charcoal making the marks come off a little strong to begin with. So if you're kind of new to charcoal, um, you can see what I'm doing here is I'm wiping it down with my palm, just kind of smoothing it up. And that, what that does is it starts to fill in the tooth a little bit of the paper and it allows the subsequent layers of that charcoal to kind of float on the surface a little bit more. And you might find, a, uh, you might find that it's a little bit easier to work with as you build up light layers. Um, and that, so that initial lay down of the charcoal may feel strong, but if you keep working it um, and build up layers of this cross hatching, kind of changing the direction of your marks as you build it up, um, you'll find that it, it, it starts to lay down a little bit smoother. Uh, 
uh, uh, Gabriel, hello from Texas. So uh, if you're new, my name is Scott. My last name is Meyer, and I am an artist here. I'm a video producer with Artist Network. Um, and this is Drawing Together. So this is the show we're on episode, what, 60, 60 something, 67-ish, I think. Um, and we just meet once a week, every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, and we draw together. And I like to kind of talk through my process a little bit. So hopefully this is an opportunity for you all to kind of test your skills. But we come up with subjects here that help us to develop um, a particular skill. So the challenge that I am giving myself with this one really is around value and edges are a big thing. Um, and so the, the opportunity that the clouds themselves present us is in, is in exploring how uh, subtle value relationships can work together um, as well as um, really paying attention to, to those edges. Um, and hopefully that all comes together um, into something that feels like it's full of light and life. It, you know, clouds are such a unique form. Um, and I want to kind of talk about what makes uh, clouds, how to, how to really render clouds in painting and drawing, some of the things that I've learned. Because as a landscape painter, I've, I've painted many clouds this, I'm just kind of knocking down some of the graphite here, kind of knocking down the tooth, trying to smooth it out a little bit. Um, and be, so you can see that I've started to build in the, the basic shape of light and dark here. And now if you use the side of your pencil, the material is going to float on the surface a little bit more, and you may find that it lifts off later. So my process for drawing is to build things up slowly, but that requires that I erase down and, and, and refine the form using the eraser. If you're finding that the marks you're laying down are not lifting off, so if you come in here and need to make adjustments, you can see that comes off really nicely. If it's not doing that for you, it's the combination of the material and the paper. So check the paper first and see if changing the paper will give you a different result. All right, so again, I'm using this small, the, uh, the, the small thumbnail of the reference photo that is below me on the screen. That's what I'm using right now. And I'm just trying to see these major forms. So just laying down some cross hatching here. That blue sky, um, it's really kind of dark and you, you could see that gradation in the reference photo. So I'll be adding that in there later. But right now I just want to start to see these basic forms. And what's kind of cool about this, this reference photo, this was actually a photo I had taken several years ago, probably four years ago, I believe. This was in, in my backyard at the time. Um, we get these really awesome thunderheads that, that form um, over the plains here in Colorado. You know, we're just, just to the east of the foothills. And so you get some wicked, you know, wicked clouds. Yeah, <laughs> they're really awesome. Um, and so I had to take a photo of this one. And I, hadn't, I had never really done anything with it. I just thought I could use it at some point. And came across it again and thought this would be perfect for this, this show and to help me explore, explore clouds a little bit. So again, I have to, now I'm kind of checking in right now to remind myself that these areas are going to be built up with light. Um, and because I, I can already feel myself kind of calibrating to this and wanting this to read as light. And when that happens, it makes me want to go darker with everything. Um, but I, uh, need to kind of resist that a little bit and just really focus on the main shapes of light and shadow. Uh, Medieval Peasant do a, it was asking if I'll do one with Conte. I think that's a great idea. I hadn't really thought about it. I know I've talked a bit about it in the past, that how I've worked with Conte in the past, but I haven't done one for this episode or this series. So um, I will put that on the list. All right. Now I'm just kind of doing a mental kind of check-in to see where I'm at. This, this right here, I think, is going to be my focal point. So I really want to um, 
make sure that I'm set up for success there. So I'm looking at some of the forms. Um, I can start to refine that, make sure that I'm kind of in the right spot. Um, and then, yeah, just uh, keeping my eyes blurred, looking at that small thumbnail, and that helps me, it helps prevent me from getting bogged down in details at this stage. And as I come across here, this is going to be a lot of fun in this area because you have these soft gradations of value. You see where that light is um, kind of bouncing around and, and through the the clouds there. Um, and so it gets a little bit more dense in some areas, lighter in others. But it, as a whole, it reads like it's in shadow. So I want to make sure I maintain that. And then just doing a quick check-in as I'm working on this area here, I'm putting my awareness on this area in the reference photo. And one of the things I noticed is that um, this area is ultimately going to be a little bit darker in value than this one. So again, I'm, I'm working on this area and I'm looking at that, but I'm kind of splitting my attention and in, in thinking about and trying to be aware of this value over here. And so much of drawing is kind of completing, being complete, is completed in that, pro that process of kind of working on one area, but thinking about another. And in that way, it helps to make sure everything stays unified. Um, I'm being really gentle, perhaps a little bit more gentle as I wipe this down than I would in other drawings. Um, this is relatively smooth paper, and this charcoal in particular is kind of sliding on, uh, sliding around it a little bit more, again, because there's not a, as much tooth. Um, generally, with charcoal, you want something with more texture, but um, I kind of like you know, the temperature of this charcoal against that gray and the way that, that paper plays a role in the value. So. Yeah, so Ania is asking a question about using these stumps here. You can certainly do that, and I'll be doing a lot of drawing with this later on to help build some of that form. All right, so what do I want to do now? I need to... Hello from Germany. Welcome, welcome. And Greg is saying, yeah, I'm pointing out that I am using my fingers a bit more, and that's I've been saying that throughout the series to not do that, and here I am being... Uh, I, I'm, I'm just going with it today, and it could come back to bite me. So what could happen if you smooth out with your fingertips? Oils on the fingertips could in, interfere with the paper and the material, and it could cause these blotchy spots. Um, so it's generally frowned upon um, to use your fingers directly, and good catch, Greg. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right, Ahmed, make a comment about uh, clouds and acrylics or soft pastels. Absolutely. I think especially pastels would be great uh, for this. So, you know, feel free to use this reference photo if you'd like to create a pastel. Um, you know, I'm going to call it a painting. That's the way I was kind of told to refer to pastel work as paintings um, by several kind of prominent pastel artists. Some people refer to them as drawings, but if you work in pastels, However you refer to it, feel free to use this. I would love to see a, a work in pastel um, of this reference. All right, so. Where do I want to go now? Let's see. Thinking out loud. Thinking out loud. Yeah, watercolors would be a lot of fun. I definitely need to work on my watercolor uh, kind of technique there. I know some great artists that would do amazing with this. Um, because this is relatively soft, what I think I'm gonna do is work from left to right this time. Um, when we look at this, this is already really ground down quite a bit, so I may end up having to sharpen this uh, throughout the episode. Um, so I may have to take a little break at some point. Um, there's a little cloud that kind of comes out, like the little back end of the cloud that peeks out around here. I think I'm gonna get rid of that um, for this reference.
Maybe what I need to do is actually shift to this darker one. So a lot of this drawing is going to be completed using negative drawing. Uh, so I'm actually I'm working on the sky, but as I work kind of from these center areas up to the edge, that's when I can start to tighten up and refine things a little bit. And I want to be careful about how I use line. Again, that's something that we've talked a lot about in this uh, in this series is using this as a way to explore the relationship between shape and line. When, when we create a line to define an edge, it, it suggests the edge of an object. And when it's overstated, it can kind of confuse the viewer's mind a little bit. So if you're going for realism, in general, trying to remove the, the contour lines is, is what you're going to go for. Um, but you can also use line kind of sparingly to kind of sharpen up an edge, um, add some expression to the work. You just want to be in control of how you, how you utilize line in your work. So in this case, as I come up to the edge of this cloud, I want to th think about kind of blending it out so that it doesn't leave a dark, a dark edge there. I'm from Mexico, Portugal, and Canada. Hello. Brazil. Ah, yes, Greg is saying, yeah. Uh, just my own experience when doing skies, they have to be so smooth and soft. I'd freak out if I touch the paper. Yeah, Greg, I could, I, I could totally see that in your work. You have such, um, when you're working in, in those, those sky areas, you have these large areas I can see how that could really be problematic if you get a blotch in there. So, all right. So I'm, I'm going to think what I'm going to do is just be mindful of where I'm using that black. And since I have it in my hand, I'm actually going to go against what I just said in terms of working from left to right and drop in some value over here. Because then I'm going to shift back to that natural toned, uh, the tinted charcoal. But I like having I like having some of that that darker value dropped in. Uh, so I, I'm also now I'm paying attention to the direction of my marks, um, and because I'm seeing some directionality there. And one of the things that's happening is the the charcoal is scratching the paper just a little bit, and it's leaving some marks there that may not be able to remove. But that's all right. Uh, so if I see marks, so if I'm working on that blue sky, I want to just make sure that they, they continue uh, behind the cloud. Because otherwise what could happen is if I, if I have the marks running in one direction here, and then this section here is completed with marks that run in a, a different direction, the viewer's mind will interpret them as being two different things rather than a continuation of that sky. So the use of direction can really be helpful um, in, in unifying some of these forms. And if you're kind of ever uncertain about the direction of your marks or what direction you should make your marks, you can always switch to a, a circular mark like I'm doing right in here. That works out all right. So then, then, then these marks ran, are running in this direction, and I can see that noticeably. So I want to run them vertically now to help tie them together. Those are one of some of the Gestalt principles um, that d describe how we interpret visual information. Is that you know when we see marks that are running in the same direction, we we tend to view them as belonging together. Doing a little drawing with my fingers there. Oh, uh, Vatma's asking about the cat, if you can see it closely. I can bring out another one real quick, because I have it right here. So this is an episode from a few weeks back where we drew this cat together. So if you want to see how this was done, check back. Look in the playlist below. 
um, you know, on the Artist Network YouTube channel where we, we worked on this drawing and you could see that whole thing being done. So that, that was a lot of fun. Um, actually, I need to sharpen this pencil. Some pe people ask me all the time how I sharpen my pencils. So for those of you who have been with me for a while, you already know. But if you're new, this is how I do it. And I know I'm dropping it right onto my paper. Oh, that's all right. I'll blow that off. But I just need to give myself a little bit more of that, um, more of that core to draw with. The key to this is really making sure your blade is sharp. And that's something that I neglect all the time. It always comes back to bite me. <laughs> like, I'll just, I won't, I won't, uh, I won't have that blade sharp and um, I'll just keep breaking off the, uh, the core, whether it's graphite or charcoal. So I not, I'm not gonna, I normally would kind of go even farther and start to shave this down with the blade, but I'm not gonna do that here because I can kind of achieve the same results by utilizing the side of the pencil here on the paper. And you know, if I get to the point when I need that fine detail and I, if I don't have it, then I will, uh, I'll sharpen it. But if I kind of roll it in my fingers as I fill in some of these darker areas, uh, then I will uh, gradually be sharpening that, that tip. Um, what I want to do is actually block this in. So, um, as you, as we've talked about before in this series, that this this process is all about kind of building it up as you go. So the the idea is that the image is kind of emerging, it's developing on the page, kind of like those old school um, film photographs. If anybody worked in a dark room, you would see that just kind of emerge in the uh, in the um, chemicals there. And that's kind of the way I like to think about it. And as you go, you're just gradually refining. And the reason I like to do that is that that aligns with the way we actually process information about these clouds. So if I look at that, if I look at that photo in an instant, I know that it's clouds, and I can um, I can recognize it. The brain processes that information really quickly. Um, what's difficult to really understand is how we arrived at that conclusion so quickly. What are the the, the unique characteristics of this particular cloud, its forms, its values, its shapes, um, that, that tell me that that's what I'm looking at. And so we, we kind of build the drawing um, at the same time as we're building our observations of the, uh, the subject. You know, so we're taking time with the subject and gradually improving our understanding of it and then allowing that to kind of be displayed on the on the page. That's where the word draw has multiple meanings, right? It means to make marks on a page, but it also means to, to pull things out. Um, like we draw water from a well or blood from a vein. And drawing names from a hat. So I'm thinking about just this general shape. Kind of roughed it in and it's probably not accurate, but if you know, it's, if it's close enough, I'm all right. Um, the, I could start to talk a bit about what makes, uh, what really takes your, your cloud drawings to the next level. What I see happening is, is uh, artists who follow that natural tendency to create uh, consistent and repeated marks. So if I fall down this edge, for example, I can see that it kind of makes this kind of sequence of steps. And my instinct would be to make them a even spaced uh, repetitive form and and that that's not really the truth of it it's, it's very very rarely do we see things with um, with regular formations um, and repeated forms that are that are identical and uh, so we want to have some sort of rhythm to these forms and sometimes I'll, I'll fudge it a little bit to make it even more dynamic or believable um, create more visual rhythm by increasing the difference between those. Um. 
guys to comment about giving up and using a belt sander on your charcoal after after they break. Yeah, no, I, I hear it. I've had that happen so many times. Um, but I, I do say that there's, that's, I do like the, the Derwent pencils for that reason. I, they, I, and it could just be the wood that's used to case it, that it perhaps it's a little bit stronger, but I haven't had any trouble with breakage on these pencils. Um, and some other brands I've had that issue. Um, all right, so thinking about that general form. So what, what may end up happening here is you can see I'm blocking in the shadows here, but as I lay that light down in here, I may find that this is too dark, in which case I'll actually erase back down to the, 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 the raw paper. Um, but in, I, I kind of need to be able to see the distinction between light and shadow a little bit more clearly on these early stages. Down in here, I can leave this as the, just the, the tone of the page. This Again, this is the gray-toned uh, Strathmore paper. And I'm kind of switching to circular marks as I block these in so that I don't have strong directional marks that could impede the form. But in general, it's, they're kind of vertical in nature. And this, this whole area is going to be a lot of fun to draw where you get that light bouncing around, reflecting off of the cloud itself into certain areas. And you have like these areas of translucency um, contrast against air, some areas that seem more opaque. Uh, that's that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and so if I were painting this, that, that would be really the challenge. And I'm not... I'm not going to be too persnickety again with some of these proportions. I'm just kind of reacting to them as I go. You know, so my initial attempt is to try to be as close as I can, but if I'm off, I'm not going to hurt myself to try to fix it. So here's another area where I need to be careful of repetitive forms. We see these kind of darker columns in the shadow that are it's almost like fingers wrapping up around that cloud, right? And they, they look fairly regularly spaced, but as I put my awareness on the spacing, you can see that they're not quite, there's a rhythm to it. There's a, there's a, a staggered rhythm to it that um, I want to be mindful of. So some are, this is a little bit wider down in here. These two are a little bit uh, kind of closer together. Then there's a gap and then these two close together. But that's an area that I found myself really struggling with for a long time in my landscape work is I would go with that, that sense of rhythm and make things too evenly spaced. And then there's this subtle kind of bank of clouds right in here that's in that shadow. That's going to be a lot of fun too. So is everybody else drawing along with? If you are, I'm curious to hear how things are going. Anybody stuck anywhere? All right, welcome, Jerry's. Good to see you back here again. Everything is going all right. And the, these clouds up here, this is just going to be a lot of fun. I'd say just have fun with these edges. Really let them get soft. And what's going to make this all come together are the few areas where you end up with kind of a sharper edge, some greater detail. Allow that edge to kind of emerge out of there. Sally is saying a bit of an ugly place. Now remember what I said too, if, you, if you're new, you wouldn't have heard me say this, but every drawing goes through what we call an ugly duckling stage. Power through it, power through it. You'll get there. That's, that's healthy drawing if it's going through the ugly duckling stage because that means that you're really working for it and you're not relying on kind of repeated and practiced motions um, yeah, it's, you know, one of the reasons that we're here is that we like to challenge ourselves as artists. 
and give ourselves new challenges that help us grow and we're not sticking with what's comfortable. You know, sometimes it's, it's really healthy to, to you just kind of need to do something that you know you can be successful at. And then other times you need to really challenge yourself. Oh, this area, right down in here, um, this is it kind of, I didn't notice it at first. When I did my first drawing, it kind of snuck up on me what's happening down in here. There's some light kind of passing through in these, these ridges that, were, that was a lot of fun to work on because it's so kind of subtle. Uh, so I, it just occurred to me as I got back down to that area that I saw those again. So have fun with those. We'll, we'll get to that. I want to create more of a gradation. I want to darken this area up over here. Look at that. I've got to lost that ground plane. <laughs> so uh, it's all gone now. I'll, I'll get that back. And again, that's because I'm using this, this charcoal. It's a little bit softer from, uh, compared to some of the others in the set on this smooth drawing paper. Um, but I, I tried it on a heavier tooth paper and it just didn't quite have the effect that I wanted in the drawing. I, I, like, I like the softness here um, using this, these materials, but it's not really ideal for charcoal, but I think it's gonna work for this subject. Okay. Welcome everybody who's coming in late. Um, uh, Daniel is asking, where am I filming from? I am in, United, in the United States in Colorado. It's another beautiful day here. We just had snow recently. So it's the middle of the day. It's probably getting dark where if you're on the East Coast. It's going to get start getting dark soon. I know I still haven't adjusted to that idea yet that things get dark earlier. All right, what do I want to do now? I'm going to let this, let's see, I'm just going to let that all kind of blend together. I want that smooth gradation in there. So that, that area of softness is going to contrast against some of those sharper edges there. Heather, I don't know if you or your dad are watching, but I want to say hello. Heather's been drawing with us for a while, and she just just saw a post of hers. She and her dad showing their drawings together. Anybody else drawing along? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's another. I know there's a an exhibit uh, for all of you who've been working on it. I got a. Um, an email saying that there's an exhibit of drawings completed in during this series as well as you know from some others other resources so right now I'm I know it looks like I'm scowling at you but I'm kind of evaluating the drawing from a distance on the screen in front of me um, so squinting my eyes to see how things are starting to take shape. I need to darken this in a little bit. See if there's anywhere that's kind of distracting me. All right. What do I need to do now? What do I need to do? I think I need to add a little bit more kind of definition up in here right now. Kind of setting the, the table by working on these clouds that are in the background. Um, and I don't want these to be the focal points, so I'm just gonna really suggest them more than anything. And I, I can, I'm recognizing that some of these proportions are kind of off, but that's all right. As long as it reads believably in the, in the drawing, I don't like, I didn't like the way this is that was trailing off the page there. It's too heavy up here. So I'm gonna, gonna close this off just a little bit. Um, it's one of the nice things about landscape work is that is it, a bit, it is a bit more forgiving sometimes in terms of proportions. You can be off a little bit more than in portraiture. And for me, again, it's all about understanding the structure. It's the same with working with trees. You know, it's about understanding the way the, the leaves, the branches all flow and then trying to recreate that flow more than anything, rather than try to necessarily make a photographic um, reproduction of it.
think I need to bring in my eraser here to I kind of model some of that form a little bit. And so hopefully it's starting to read as, as these clouds, and, and that's before we even lay in any of the light charcoal. That's kind of the way I like to work with, work with it on toned paper, is to you know, really understand the light and shadow structure um, you know, just using the, the toned paper and then pop it all out using the, kind of saving my, the high end of my tonal range for, uh, for, for later. So I can see that the proportions are off a bit here, and that's all right for me. I don't think I'm going to really spend much time working on that. I'm going to use the kneaded eraser actually, kind of tap. This is a what's nice about using the kneaded eraser is it makes kind of more organic forms. So this is really becomes more of a gesture than, uh, than anything. Because again, it's not about copying the photograph; it's about using the photograph to understand the way clouds function. And the drawing process kind of slows our thoughts down a bit to really kind of start to understand them. To me, that's the value in, in, in art. It's, it's the drawing process that's more important than the drawing itself as an object. Right in here, there's the light starts to catch, so I need to erase that out a little bit. Kind of switching between positive and negative drawing a bit to um, pull out some of these forms. So this is just one of the slim Derwent eraser. I really like this. It's serving me well um, compared to kind of the bulkier uh, erasers that I've been using in the past. All right. Mia is saying that you always overwork the clouds so too much, so they end up looking artificial and too controlled rather than whimsical and natural. Any tips? It's that is a really good observation. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I in general, you know, I think you're you're thinking about it correctly in that overworking them can make them feel too too heavy. Um, because they're such, um, because they're, they're forms that are constantly changing, um, I, I think it, it makes sense to really treat them more as gestures than anything. And, and I like to think more about the way things are flowing and moving. Uh, you know, so if a cloud is building and billowing, I'll, I'll kind of bring my marks up. And if it's a, you know, it's longer, Kind of more kind of stream like I'll change the direction of my marks so, so changing the direction and the quality of the marks to match the way the um, you match the motion of the object really the way it fills the space and um, and then in general then what you might try doing is lay it down wipe it down lay it again wipe it down and you each time you lay it down, you're trying to get at a perhaps a stronger gesture rather than keep hammering at that, that one over and over again and, and then ending up overworking it. Um, having said that, though, I think there's always value in overworking. You know, sometimes if you know you've overworked it, it's almost best just to keep going and really push it um, so that you understand the form to an even greater degree and then try to come back in with a gesture and try to hit that more, more quickly. Oh, Greg is asking if I looked at that Tombow Mono Zero. I did not yet. It's been a busy week, but I, that's definitely on my radar. Um, so now I'm looking at the, I've got my, my blending stump here. I'm looking at these forms and I, I wanna keep reminding myself to, to, I want there to be a visual rhythm to all of this. 
uh, so I don't want evenly spaced marks. You see that like in, in some you know portrait drawings, you'll see people creating eyelashes that are all evenly spaced, right? Or um, you know, in this case, uh, case clouds that uh, that have like evenly spaced kind of bumps, right? Because it's fun to get into that rhythm. It's more about the way our body moves than anything. Um, but you know, think about there being a a rhythm to it all. All right, I'm just kind of blocking in some of these forms. We're going to be doing a lot of drawing with the white and actually blending some of these materials together. So I'm kind of sneaking up on this edge and then we're going to kind of come in on this direction and sneak up on that edge too. And I like the blending stump in here because it really kind of softens out some of these areas. And, and through all of this, I'm still using really kind of a soft focus on my, my gaze. Everything's kind of blurry in my vision. And I keep forgetting to kind of talk about that, but I, um, I do a majority of the drawing with my eyes out of focus. And that prevents me from being overwhelmed by the details. And I see the, the primary value structure a bit more effectively that way. So we're kind of, we're going back through this again now, just gradually refining the forms. So I work in this area. What I'm starting to look at are the, is the transition between the shadow and the light on these edges and, you know, that um, conveys a lot of information about the texture of the clouds is that that transition line you know whether it's a smooth soft transition or like in this area where it's highly textured and then here i love this this is i think it's this is actually probably my favorite part of the drawing is right in here there's that back wall that we talked about before. So the light is coming in and it's bouncing off of this, this cloud here onto this back wall and it's illuminating with that, some of that bounce light, this, uh, it's the back side of that bowl essentially. All right, what am I doing now? Okay. So now I'm going to come back in from this side, and I'm, now I'm going to really kind of refine this edge. Um, kind of doing some negative drawing, I can add some more of that texture. You know, think about varying your marks. This is really just kind of sharpening it. Here, there's one and never went back in and sharpened that pencil, but it's, it's giving me plenty of what I need in terms of that, that sharp edge. And here, I'm, I'm going to lay down this line. It's a little bit heavy, but I'm going to see how that, see if it works for me. And I want to make sure that that line is broken. If it's too hard and flat, it's going to flatten out the clouds. It's going to lose any sort of life in the drawing. All right. How does that work? I'm just going to move to this area because I need to clear my head just a little bit. Um, this area doesn't require as much thinking. So this, this is my little playground area. I'm going to come back to here when I need to just kind of clear my head. Uh, um, get rid of that ground plane. 
Another another uh, shout out to the Tombow Zero Mono Zero Eraser Whiskers KE is saying. Um, uh, Robin is asking any tips to make charcoal lines streaky, less streaky. I've tried blending a bit, but I can still see where I lay down the charcoal originally. Uh, Robin, that's a good question. That sounds to me like the paper is holding that a bit too much. Um, I, in general, when I've had that that trouble. Um, it'll help to actually lay down, put down a layer of vine charcoal first and then lay the compressed charcoal on top. So you might give that a shot. And if you, if you can't go back, you may try using the vine charcoal to help smooth it out um, and then lay the compressed charcoal in again on top of it. Wolfwood is saying, if only I had any artistic talent, my love for drawing and painting definitely do not match my skills. I am glad you're sharing that. Um, this is drawing, drawing and painting is really all a series of decisions. And I believe anybody can learn to make those decisions. And with practice, you end up developing the hand-eye coordination necessary to execute those decisions. Some people are kind of born with a kind of a natural dexterity that serves them well, but it's all something that can be learned. Um, and just for some, it just takes a little bit more practice than others. So, so I did a little bit of negative drawing because I like this alternating sequence. We have the dark sky, we have light into dark, then we have this dark cloud here against that light back here. That's, that's really kind of exciting there. So a lot of what's happening in this drawing is trying to suggest the detail more than anything, more than making that detail explicit. So now I'm going to come back in and here, kind of sharpen up some of these edges. In particular, this this one here, but I'm trying to be uh, trying to be gentle with the lines here. But going back to the idea of decisions, sometimes people make decisions to to not decide or kind of let instinct guide the drawing process, and there's a lot of value in that as well. So um, just keep going. If you love it, do it. So there's a lot of, along that edge, there's a lot of kind of skipping across the surface to try to discourage me from creating hard, consistent lines. It's almost like I'm thinking about creating a sequence of dots more than anything. And here the texture is a bit stronger in that transition area. I'm going to change the direction of my marks a little bit. And here it stays a little softer. Stepping, I'm just kind of looking back a little bit at, from, at this, squinting at the, the small version of the drawing that I'm seeing in front of me to try to evaluate it. I'm curious too, uh, how the, the pace at which you all work. Um, you know, we, we talked about a bit about this in, in past episodes, but I like to, to think about the relationship between the artist and the medium as an opportunity to um, kind of think through the medium. I, I, the term I like to use is uh, working at the speed of thought. So which medium allows you to, to make your marks at the same pace, the same cadence at which your observations about the subject are coming together. You know, we, we all think at different paces and I think that plays into the rhythm and the speed at which we work. Um, because I, you know, I know for me, I generally work faster than than other people. Uh, I'm on the faster end, and I know some people who definitely work faster than me, um, but others that would, you know, much much slower. And I was always really jealous of people who could take their time with with a drawing. I would just get so impatient. Um, so I don't. I'm curious to hear any of your thoughts on that matter. Um, it can feel somewhat impressive sometimes to work quickly to those who don't make work. 
Um, but for me, I was always impressed by the people who could sit with it for longer periods of time. Think about Antonio Lopez Garcia, the Spanish realist who could work for months and years on paintings and drawings. And I always wish I had that, that sense of discipline and persistence. All right. So as I'm going through now, I'm just kind of tapping down some of these layers rather than really blending them just to help kind of unify it. But I'm looking for some of the subtle shifts in value in here. And so now by adding that dark, it starts to create the sense of reflected light in there. But I think I'm at the point where I need to pull out that white charcoal now. Uh, Wolfwood is saying, how do you decide when a drawing painting is finished? How can you prevent yourself from always keep improving the piece you're working on? Um, that's a really good question as well. You know, for me, when I work from life, um, I, I generally stop when I feel like I've understood this, the object. You know, for me, the act of drawing and painting is a way to better understand the world around me, not necessarily just a way to, to make an image, but it's using the drawing or painting process to understand the subject better. And once I've understood that subject and I, f I feel like I've, I'm just, just filling in paper or canvas, that's generally when I stop myself. And so sometimes a, a painting or, or drawing will feel unfinished, but it captures the understanding of the, of the form. And uh, so that's it. When I work non-objectively, I've been trying to do some abstract painting. Let me tell you, that is <laughs> it's very humbling. That stuff is hard. I don't know. Working abstractly is a challenge for me, um, but I need to do it um, to kind of explore mediums and colors, compositions in new ways. Um, and then that becomes much more difficult for me to determine when a painting is done or when a drawing is done. So that, then it becomes really um, just a matter of kind of intuition. But I think in general though, it's like, again, when you, if I feel like I'm filling space without really making any more statements about the subject, that's when I, I call it done. Greg is saying he definitely works slow. Um, and Alicia, I feel like I attach to some mediums more than others. Yeah, definitely. Like I, I, I can understand that as well. There's, um, you know, for me, oil paints, I just keep coming back to them, although I really like pastels. And every time I work with pastels, I say, I should work with them more. But I just keep finding myself gravitating back to oils. Um, and then with drawing, again, it's the same. When I've tried working in, in uh, colored pencil, I need to adjust the way I work, and it's almost a little bit too slow. So, um, yeah, Ed, that's Whisker K. He just posted that. Uh, try colored pencil drawing. It's impossible to go fast. Exactly. That's why it's so hard for me. And I really admire a great uh, colored pencil artists. Um, yeah. So now I've got the white charcoal, as you can see, and I'm laying that down. You can see right away what it's doing to the sense of light in the drawing and that value range. And so I'm using these small circular marks and again, I'm trying to vary those marks too because I, I don't want consistent spirals working down the drawing. And I'm starting with kind of initial light pass. So I'm not being very heavy with it. And then I'm gonna go back in and then really kind of bear down a bit more to, uh, to create some of the highlights on those bumps, if that makes sense. That's what's really kind of creating that, that texture. And then as I work into that shadow area, you can kind of, I'm just using really a, a very light touch to, to help kind of blend. And if you roll your pencil as you, as you go, um, you know, it doesn't get too bogged down. It doesn't get too built up with, with charcoal. So I'm kind of using it as a blending tool as well. And so as you're going through, you can start to see the form of the clouds um, emerging and think about you know, the direction of the light, where the light's coming from. Here it's a little bit softer 
Uh, so I'm not going to apply as much pressure there. And I'm just trying to vary the marks as much as possible um, to make it feel really more naturalistic. Kind of lifting away there. There we go. Um, Nia is saying, I go too fast and then I make too many mistakes and then I get disheartened. I take a break and then I repeat the process at nauseum. I, uh, that, I've, I've definitely experienced that as well. Um, it's good to connect with those things and, and hopefully um, you can settle in on a process that really aligns with who you are and what your natural sensibilities are. Um, and so Nia, then what might be what might be helpful is to experiment with different mediums. It sounds like you do a lot of experimentation anyways, based on some of the comments you make, but um, it seems like you've been working with a lot of different materials. But um, you know, like I said, I know some materials I just work better with than others. So I'm working up in this area. It's a little bit softer, so it allows me to use the side of the pencil, and that gives me that sharper edge. So kind of what I'll, I'll, I'll probably be doing is working back and forth between this highly uh, kind of deep, sharper focused area and then this broader area here, just so I can sharpen my pencil when I'm up in this area. And uh, I'm kind of starting inset from this, this edge, kind of working my way up into it to kind of feather that out so that I don't end up with a sharp edge uh, the, uh, around in here. So really just using the weight of the pencil there. And I kind of like the, the, the tone, the quality of the gray that's created by mixing these two charcoals together. So that doesn't always happen, so you want to be careful with that as you're working. If you're adding the white charcoal or chalk at this point, there can be a, a temperature contrast between warm and cool that um, may not work for you, but I think that's what I what I really like about these uh, Derwent tinted charcoals is that they uh, I can really kind of dial in that temperature. I can I chose this one specifically because I like the way it reacts to the white charcoal as well as the tone of the paper. Uh, uh, Krista Henson, how come drawings don't look exactly like you expected when you don't? use really fancy and expensive materials, uh, mar pencils, markers, and pens. It confuses me a lot. Um, you know, good quality materials in general are really helpful. Um, one of the things that is often neglected is the relationship between those materials and the surface. And so sometimes you can have an amazing material, uh, you know, say a pen or something, but it um, if it's the wrong paper, it can really kind of throw things off. So for example, I was working with some water soluble markers, these watercolor markers the other day, and I tried it just on regular sketch paper and it was really frustrating for me. I tried it on watercolor paper, which it was kind of designed for, and it was a completely different experience. And the same can happen with charcoal or graphite. So check that out. Um, and, but you know, otherwise it's, it's difficult to really know um, without really kind of being there. Um, Mia is saying, rarely am I successful and happy with my artwork. And that's, that's sad to hear. I hope we can change that. Um, I think it's really important if you're evaluating your work, what I found is that it's generally easier for people to be, to kind of connect with what can be improved I find that most people I work with are harder on themselves, um, and, but it's really and it's really important to do that. You want to know well what what could you could do better next time, um, but it's just as important to identify what you're doing well because then you're more likely to repeat it. Um, so, in, if you are kind of unsuccessful with your work, I almost guarantee that there's something in the work though that is successful. Now it may. It may not be entirely, you know, maybe there's, you know, the parts of the painting or drawing that aren't working out, but um, there's something in that that you can kind of take away into the next one. So 
Um, so just working up on this edge here, kind of building the lights into this kind of darker edge. And I'm looking at kind of closely at the types of marks that I'm seeing along that edge. So rather than match it one to one, I'm trying to define, well, what, what type of mark am I looking at? Is it vertical? Is it kind of curved? Is it horizontal? Is it a soft edge or a sharp edge? And then try to create marks that reflect that rather than be 100% accurate. And one thing I noticed too is that I'm not, I'm not going my bright pencil right up against that edge. The brightest part is actually just set in a little bit. That's going to help to create a sense of volume and roundness. Um, since I have this darker edge, if I bring my light edge right up next to it, um, and if it becomes too consistent, um, it can actually flatten things out. So I can be, I can bring in some bright spots here and there, but I don't want that to be too consistent. Oh, a lot of, a lot of comments coming in here. All right, I, uh, not sure I, I'm glancing at some of these comments and I'm not sure I understand them. So if there's an important question coming in, just let me know. Um, you know, as long as everybody's being cool with one another, I'm happy. I just don't want to miss any important questions. So um, one of the things that can be helpful is to type your questions in all caps. I'm more likely to see them that way. So, um, and rest assured, I don't interpret it as you're yelling, but if you type it in all caps, I can be more likely to catch it. Um, I'm glad to hear things are helpful. Uh, Gustav is asking how long I've been doing it. If you're talking about this drawing, I'm about an hour in, a little over an hour, um, but in general I've been drawing for, I really started to give drawing kind of my conscious effort almost 30 years ago now, about 30 years ago, a little over a little less than 30 years, but you know, 25, 26 years ago, I guess. Uh, and I did go to art school and then graduate school, so I spent a fair amount of time in college and then work here at Artist Network where I get to work with a lot of artists and we make instructional videos, and that has been a lot of fun. I've been learning a lot from the artists that I work with. So where there's a where I need to soften the edge a little bit, I'm kind of actually blending with the charcoal pencil a little bit to kind of soften that rather than bring out the, uh, the, the blending stump. And I kind of like the way it's, I like that tone that it's creating, that light in that, that shadow area. Uh, yeah, Gustav is saying, did I study it? Yes, so I went to school in Baltimore, um, and that's where I really got my kind of foundation in my education, and then I went up to Alaska to, to continue my graduate studies because I want to go to Alaska because I like it. Um, so you can see I'm using this this kind of modified overhand grip that allows me to kind of engage the side of the pencil, um, but I can also get some fine detail when I need it. Let's see how that reads. I kind of like, like what's happening there. I kind of let some of the, the bottom edges just kind of fade off there. I think that's working. Now we just recorded, we just released a podcast today, an episode of Artbound. Um, I don't know if anybody's been listening to it, but we worked on an episode that just released that it's about teaching. So Christy Gordon and Trey Egan are two artists that we had on kind of talking about the, the role that education plays in their own art, artistic kind of adventures. You know, it's a, a lot of fun. Uh, 
Um, and then if you are new, you're going to want to know that, I, you know, I really like to see the work that you're all creating. You know, the, the, the hope is that you're following along and creating your own work and whether it's, you know, whether you're following along uh, specifically to mine or if you're making interpretations or doing your own, your own drawing all together. I'd love to see it. So there's a link in the description below that has, that will take you to the landing page for this episode. Um, and while you're on Artist Network, if you can check out the Art Artbound podcast, that's a lot of fun. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch to this overhand grip so I can really use the side of the pencil. I'm just going to kind of block it in. Kind of soften that up a bit. So this is just a kind of a light layer on top, and then I'm going to bring in kind of the highest kind of highlights uh, in a bit on top of it. So this one is, it's a good way to practice kind of sensitivity of touch, you know, just using the weight of the pencil. Um, And then, you know, versus really kind of bearing down. I'm going to pull out a little bit of a light here. So I want to be careful as I make these marks. I want to put more pressure on the inside, the, the center of that stroke rather than the ends. And what I'm looking at is that alternating sequence of light, dark, light, dark, light again, back into the gradual dark there. Um, this cloud along in here. If you're having trouble laying in that the lights there, um, try lifting off the charcoal underneath. Sometimes that can interfere. I mean, these charcoal pencils are blending together pretty nicely, but that doesn't always happen um, depending on the, the brands or the types of charcoal that you're working with. So if you're you're finding that they're they're not layering and they're not working on top of one another very well. Try erasing down the charcoal wherever you need to lay in the lights. And one of the things you can start to notice in clouds too is that the areas where you get the highest highlight, the brightest highlight, are typically actually in like these the valleys in there, um, um, as well as some of the, the high points. So you can start to see where those are. And as you, as you observe that, that can change where you put emphasis on your mark. So like right in here, for example, it gets a little bit stronger and a little bit uh, weaker um, as you round the form. Lisa is saying you're using the same pencils, but you can't sharpen them without them breaking. So you're saying, Lisa, that you're you're using these same tinted charcoal pencils and they just keep breaking on you. Um, if that's the case, then I, I generally have found that it's I just need to make sure I have a sharper um, blade. I can't sharpen these in pencil sharpeners; they break all the time. So that's why I use a blade to do that. Um, I tried sharpening them. In a, and it just didn't work. And then it just gummed up the sharpener. Uh, so you try, try using just a straight razor blade and see if that works. Um, and if you're having trouble getting that, that white to lay down, just kind of short kind of vibrations, little squiggles can sometimes help with that. All right, I come down in here, there's a little light catching in some of these areas along that ridge. Get in here and blend a little bit. All right, and then here is where the, the kind of a more highly textured transition is. And so I'm thinking about kind of rounding that form here. 
Um, and so I'm kind of rotating and rolling that pencil up and around that form to help give it some more volume. And again, try to fight that urge if you have it to create consistent, evenly spaced kind of repeated marks. Let there be some variation and that'll read as a more natural, uh, natural form. Right in here, I laid down that, that first pass of the white. Now I'm going to go back in again and pull out some of the highlights and uh, bring in, bring them in a little bit. So bring them forward and have the, this back edge be a little bit lighter. All right, that's reading pretty well, all right. Nia is saying, I'm a perfectionist by nature. I've always been very hard on myself since young. Sadly, I love everyone else's work, but I can never see the good in my own work for some reason. Well, let's try to, let's try to help you out with that. In some way, because that, I mean, I, I get that. I've been highly critical in my own work as well. Um, and when I started to shift my perspective so that it um, really becomes about the experience, am I enjoying the time making it? When if that's my criteria, then that, that helped me to, to think about it a little bit differently rather than try to make the, uh, make the drawing the, great, the best. You know, I've, I, I think I told this story when I was in undergrad where I got really... I'd put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, I think my professors were really, um, really good at managing pressure, but I just, every time I would show up, I would have that pit in my stomach and like, I want mine to be the best. <laughs> like, and it's a ridiculous thing because there's no such thing really. Like, um, but you know, I, my ego was tied up in it so much. And I finally went to my professor, it was my junior year. And I said, hey, can I just for the rest of the semester make bad drawings? And he said, sure, go right ahead. So that's what I did. I, I just needed his permission to say, it's okay to, to make bad art. And then the rest of that semester, that's when I really learned a lot about drawing because I took risks with uh, the materials, the medium, the, the subject matter. You know, I was just doing things without thinking as much. Um, and since I had the permission to make bad drawings, the verbal permission, it really helped me. So I don't know if that works for you, but... Um, and then, yeah, that, that was, I learned so much about materials that way. And I and ultimately became happy with some of the drawings I did. But again, my, my ego was so tied up in it that it's really making it not very much fun. And that's, again, something I put on myself more than anything. All right. Really like that light there is working out. Adele is saying, what is bad art? Exactly. Difficult to tell. But you know, I think in general, if, if, if it's not working the way you want, you know, like that's not successful, but somebody else may like it. Okay. I'm going to work in this area now. I may have very little to do over in this side, but I want to get some of that reflected light. And, and I'm going to actually use the, the, the white charcoal very lightly, kind of blend in and try to see this transition in value. I try to imagine this wall back in here, it's a little bit lighter, and then we kind of, it transitions into this darker edge. And uh, so it's just, I'm trying to be really subtle with it. And then try to really see where is it stronger and where how does it how does it transition as how does it move up that wall? It's kind of bumpier here at the top. It's one of my favorite things when looking at these storm clouds in the summer that that form here is, uh, you know, the way the light bounces through and around them. They're just fascinating forms. 
So right now there's a bit of a rhythm, a re repetition of uh, form there that I need to get rid of. And I can see that in the reference photo. I made it, made these two regularly spaced and that becomes a distraction. All right, coming under here. So the light's a little bit stronger. As we come across here, it's a little bit softer, but there's still some bounce light happening there. So again, the light is coming in from this side, it's bouncing off this form back into that. And that's what's really making the, uh, that's what's really making this all come to life. So right in here, there's kind of a, an area where that light seems a little bit stronger. So I'm gonna drop that in there. So thank you, Nia, for sharing those, those thoughts. I think it's, it's one of the things I love about this show is that we can get together and kind of talk about some of these things, hopefully help each other out with that. Um, uh, there, it's a, it can be a vulnerable thing just making art. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Um, but in the end, I, you know, it's all about enjoying the process. All right. I'll lighten this area up just a touch. So another option I could have done here is I could have taken my eraser to lift it back out a little bit, but I kind of like the tone that's created um, by mixing the, the darker and lighter charcoal together. All right. So I kind of pumped up the contrast a little bit from the reference photo. I think I'm gonna let that, let that be though, kind of fun. increase the drama just a touch. Yes, Nia, go ahead and make bad art. I give you full permission. And in fact, that's the assignment for you is to make bad drawings. And you're actually gonna probably find that it's challenging to do that. Um, I think you'll find that you're a stronger artist than you're giving yourself credit for, and it'll actually be work to make quote unquote bad art. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of great art that at one point was considered bad by other people, right? So be careful with those terms. And I understand that fully. Uh, you can't really define necessarily good and bad art. And when you're, when you're doing work for yourself, is what serves you and what doesn't. Um, all right, Jessica, I'm glad. Thanks for the comments about the style of the teaching here. I'm glad that's working for you. I'm just kind of working in this area to uh, kind of sharpen up this edge just a touch. So doing some negative drawing, increasing the contrast. Again, I'm pumping it up a little bit from the reference photo. And you may have a different sensibility than I do in, with regards to this. Like maybe you, you prefer to keep some of this stuff more subtle, but I'm gonna go through and actually enhance things a little bit more than what I'm seeing in the reference. Uh, so now I'm gonna come back over to this side. And I talked earlier about these kind of ridges of light. So I'm kind of laying down a mark and kind of feathering it out. And then there's another ridge. How's that read? I think it's necessary to bring some sort of focus over here. And then I think I'm gonna to have to come back in with some darker areas a little bit. Let's see. I think I need just a little bit more form in here. Uh, just to, to give something of substance on this side. So I'm gonna drop in a little bit more stuff. What I can do, I need the, the gray again.
And then also kind of thinking about that transition, it's a little bit darker, kind of the, the, the core of, the, of, of the, the cloud is right in here. I'm gonna feather this out. And what's nice about these clouds is that they're not you know, perfectly smooth, so kind of making them a little blotchy ultimately serves the, the structure of the cloud. So. And a lot of what I, I think about as well as you know, using the direction of the mark to reinforce the structure of the object. So here there's this, this kind of scooping upward of that form. And so I can allow these marks to kind of do that. Yeah, so I think I'm, I think I've made this a bit more dramatic than the reference, but that's good. It's a pretty dramatic cloud. It was really awesome to see these things. It's hard to conceive of how large these are, you know, how many miles high these clouds can get. Um, one of the things that really, that really struck me coming out west here after growing up on the east coast and up in the northeast is that, you know, being able to glimpse these large formations. It's pretty striking. All right. Greg's got some good tips there. I always get caught up in how I do in local shows or competitions. I can get very down on myself. I think we have to just make art for ourselves and enjoy it. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, competitions are funky things that they can be really healthy to, to enter. Uh, when you have the right mindset and just you know, as long as you don't put your value as an artist in them because they, they do become suggestive they're based on the jurors and um, yeah all right I'm gonna right in here kind of add a little bit of variation it's a pretty consistent tone in there so I want to make some variation there and then I'm gonna have to recreate that that ground plane that we started with is now completely gone because I've wiped it down is now on my fingers and I, the palm of my hand now how does that read from a distance I think I want to think I want to bring a little bit more definition over here right now that these forms are a bit too subtle I, though we're an hour and a half in so I need to move this thing along this might be an area that you spend a little bit more time on than that I really have time here but you get I got the values pretty much where I want them to be but I think the form could be refined a little bit but I also don't want to bog this down too much And then what I'm seeing too is I've got these even stripes. That is not working. That is throwing things off. So I need to adjust that. It's ultimately becoming a distraction. So it's not serving the drawing there. That creates a little bit more variation that way. Okay. Where am I at now? Um, Adele saying you get those these storms like this in Australia, I bet. I bet that's amazing. I'd love to head out there sometime. That easel I was just talking about, this artistic easel that's holding this up, that comes out of Australia. Um, it's kind of a fun, fun thing. All right, what am I doing? I just want to sharpen up some of these areas in here. Um, bring a little bit of definition into it. Right now I'm scowling at you, I apologize, but I'm just trying to observe the, the drawing kind of on this, as it appears on the screen to, to make any adjustments. Let's see where, I'm happy with what's happening up in here because this is really unfinished, still, still very gestural, but that contrast against this that's more finished, I think is working out all right. So um, I think I'm in pretty good shape down there. So I think I'm gonna move on to that ground plane. You know, I may end up working on this a little bit more after the, uh, after the show is over, but 
All right, so actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this, this slightly lighter. So again, I have the, the dark charcoal and then I have this natural. It's a little bit lighter in value. I'm gonna actually block it in with the, uh, block in the ground plane with this, um, the lighter one and then come back in with some of the darker one to add some depth to the shadows. So I'm gonna keep this very gestural and I'm gonna do my best to not outline anything because what I want to have happen is some, when somebody looks at this drawing, their eye goes up to that cloud um, and just kind of accepts the ground plane and just kind of skips beyond that, right? So if I leave it too unfinished, it becomes a distraction. If I make it too finished, it becomes a distraction. So there's finding, it's a matter of finding that right balance and a lot of that can be subjective. Um, and I, I'm gonna have to decide for myself what works and what doesn't. And I can get your feedback. I can still see some remnants of my old my old marks there, but um, and again, I'm intentionally not using an outline because I want these to sit down. If I use a line, it's going to draw too much attention to that edge. So really, just kind of keeping these sketchy. But this, this one here, this tree that kind of stands out. And then trying to think about the shape here because it's not a symmetrical form. That's another thing that um, we tend to do is we have an instinct to create symmetrical forms, which very rarely exist in nature. And then visually, they um, they read as static on the page, and want something that has more life to it. Um, you want something that has a bit more variety. And do some negative drawing to drop that barn. That's a neighbor Rex, his barn. But I'm just going to suggest that as a negative drawing there. How's that read? That gets that reads all right. I think I'd like to. What do we want to do? I need to make this even darker in here. So one of the things that's helpful right now is I have this bar here on the bottom end of the table that I'm resting my wrist on. And that's helping me to, it provides a guide so that I can create kind of horizontal marks. I'm gonna switch them to vertical here. Just kind of filling in the space, but it aligns with the direction of the grasses there. So if anything, we'll suggest the, uh, suggest the grasses. They're kind of too evenly spaced, but. Oh, you're welcome, Nia. Thank you for the comments. Just gonna smooth this out a little bit. Now I'm gonna come back in with a dark one and drop in these shadows. And then this is, this is the part I like, is when you take something that's dark, then you add something that's even darker and that dark reads, that initial dark kind of reads as light. Um, it's really cool. Something I see, it took me a while to learn in my landscape painting is to uh, go darker with areas, especially in the trees, the, the light. I wanna, I, my instinct was to always make them, the, the light areas in the trees, lighter than they actually are. As soon as I was comfortable dropping the value in, down in them, it just turned out better. All right, bye everybody. Oh, what paper am I using? Lisa is asking. This is a Strathmore um, gray toned sketch paper. Do I have it? Oh yeah, this is the paper. I love it. It's been working out really well for me. So um, they also make a tanned toned, tan toned paper that um, I've used a bit in this Early on in this series, I used. So 
So along this horizon line too, think about varying those values, especially the touch points against that sky. You don't want it to be a hard line. You don't want that tree line to be really hard. It's, it's, uh, you want to have variation there. Otherwise, it's just going to flatten out, and then we're going to it's going to draw too much attention to that to that edge. And then, just like the clouds, when you're working on these trees, just kind of suggest the form. It's kind of what Nia was saying earlier, kind of overworking those clouds. This is an area where just less is more. And trust the viewer's mind to fill in that information. Our, ma our minds are already primed to look for information. You know, that's, that's what they do. Is they, our brains make sense of stuff. Um, and so we don't have to do a lot of work to, to convince that. We always, it's like we, sometimes when we make work, artwork, we, we feel like we have to make things overly explicit because for some reason, it, otherwise we're not going to understand what um, we're looking at, but you know, don't fear that the the brain is already it's already doing that work for you. It does everything it can to make sense of what it's looking at. Um, that's why we see faces and trees and rocks and stuff. And um, So there's a lot of power and suggestion of form because you're, you're giving the brain the opportunity to do what it's designed to do, which is to take information from the outside world and make sense of it all. If we do all the work for it, then for me, it's just less exciting if we do all that work by making it overly explicit. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna worry about these buildings down in here because it's not about the ground plane. I just need enough of that ground plane, again, for the, the eye to accept it. And I can see, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to include the ground plane is that it provides that contrast in value. It puts these values in context, so then we're calibrating things in a different way. Um, we're calibrating to the full range of values. You know, if Without this, these darks, then we calibrate to this, and we assign that as the darkest dark. Um, so this it just increases the, the understanding of light um, when, we, when we add that, that hit of dark down here on the bottom. And then we've got this kind of fence down in here that I'll, I'll suggest. Um, and I think that's a, I think that's pretty much it. I don't want to do too much more. Um, just these thin kind of horizontal lines to give some sort of structure to that ground plane. Maybe break it up a little bit with some of these fence posts that are going to run over there and then add some of these darker spots along in here to just give a little bit of structure, but I'm just gonna suggest some of that. I don't wanna get bogged down on these, these details here, because I know you've all been with me for a while now, so um, I don't wanna keep you here longer than is necessary. Bring in some taller grasses here in the foreground. Notice that's actually a little apple tree that I planted that did not survive. And be careful as I as I'm you can see I'm placing in these kind of darker marks. I don't want to avoid them being evenly spaced as well. So looking at the perspective, they would be a little bit more open as we get towards the bottom, get tighter and tighter as we get towards that background there. So um, I need to make sure that I'm not being too consistent with with my marks here and to making them too evenly spaced. All right, 
I think that's that's it for now. What do y'all think? Fun nut <laughs> is asking, what's the longest you think you've ever spent on a drawing? I spent, I did a, a life-size self-portrait, full body kind of self-portrait um, in college. That took a couple weeks. Um, but that's about it. I, I lose my patience after a while. And I like to get things done. Just adding a little bit of these lights, I think that's going to be helpful to, um, again, for the viewer's mind to accept that ground plane. But yeah, this is all very abstract, very suggested down in here, a bit more impressionistic than actually being ex explicit with anything. So. Um, Perfect. Well, thank you very much for any of the, all the compliments that are coming out. I hope you all have been joining and kind of following along. If you, um, if you are new, again, the, the reference image is in the description below. Um, so you can bring that up and work on your own drawing. I'd love to see it. So share it on Artist Network. Um, we meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to do this, this guy next, the Puffin. Uh, but I'll be doing that in either charcoal or graphite. I haven't decided yet, or maybe some other drawing pencil. Um, I don't know, unless there's an interest in seeing markers sometime, I might do a colored, um, a colored image and I could use some of those markers or something at some point, but kind of like working in these, these more traditional drawing materials. Um, and then, yeah, again, we meet every, every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern on Thursdays. Uh, join us with Gigi Chen. She has a painting together in acrylics. So she's gonna be working with us tomorrow uh, that's going to be a fun one. And I think I'm pretty much done here. So I'm just going to hang out for a few minutes to see if there's any other additional questions. But right now I'm just kind of picking away at this drawing. So thank you all for joining me. This has been a lot of fun. I'm really excited about this image. So um, thank you for, for letting me share that with you all. Um, if I compare it to this initial one, you know, I think I was able to spend a little bit more time in the details, but it's, I, I feel like there's something about the, the drama in this one that is, is appealing, um, a little bit punched up in terms of that contrast that I'm happy with. So, um, perfect. Again, thank you so much. I'm going to sign off and just trying to draw for a little while here. I think I'm going to head out. Anybody who, because I see some new people that just came in. So if you do want to watch this, as soon as I hit end record, it's going to take a few minutes to process the video and it'll come back up as a recording. So you can see the full thing if you'd like to see how this was made. Um, check out all the other episodes here of Drawing Together. And if you missed it, or you, um, if, you, uh, if you wanted to follow along or you wanted to join us live, again, we do this every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. So um, we will have to see you next week. So thank you all. Have a fantastic week. Have a great weekend.